going to share with you out of the book of Jonah today, who is an Old Testament minor prophet. I felt like it was a minor prophet day in the house of God. <laughs> and I, I love the prophetic books of the Old Testament because when you understand prophecy, you understand that when the word of God comes to a person for a region, it oftentimes has a dual fulfillment. It's not just for the people of that time in that place, but it carries within it prophetic principles that you can apply to our modern day context, even in this moment. And the book of Jonah, I think, helps describe one of those moments. In fact, a lot of people don't know this, but the book of Jonah records the greatest revival in all of Scripture where an entire city is transformed in a day. And I thought, man, no better text to preach in our cultural moment than out of the book of Jonah this morning, starting in chapter 1 and in verse 1. This is what the Bible says. The Bible says this, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Not the word of man, not the word of culture, not the word of politics, not the word of sociological constructs. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Now you got to see this. God raised up Jonah to be a prophet during a time of great distress for the nation of Israel. The northern kingdom had been captured by a new world superpower named the Assyrian Empire. And the capital of this new empire was a city named Nineveh. In fact, you can visit the ruins of Nineveh today in modern day Iraq. See, the people of Nineveh, they worship the Assyrian goddess of sex. Her name was Ishtar. And when the authors of Scripture described the city of Nineveh, they said things like this. It's a city of blood, full of lies and robbery, never without victims. A city that has enslaved people with its witchcraft and prostitution. Many casualties, piles of dead, and bodies without number. And friend, if you worship the goddess of sex, you will find yourself in the exact same position today. Enslaved, full of lies, and never without victims. It's interesting do you know who led the Assyrian Empire? A ruler named Serendopolis. It's interesting, history tells us that Serendopolis lived as a woman. He was famous for cross-dressing and wearing makeup. He was known for making his voice sound higher to match the octaves of his favorite female concubine. And often he stated that physical fornication was the only purpose of life. If Serendopolis would eventually die in an act of suicide by setting himself on fire along with his favorite male and female lovers. And do you think that our culture is any different today? See, the answer to wickedness in a city is God raising up a remnant of the righteous. The Bible says the word of the Lord came to Jonah because the circumstance of the city arose to God. See, darkness looked like it had won. Wickedness look like it had won. Depravity look like it had won. But for every spiritual crisis in any major city, there is a God-sized solution he is getting ready to release. See, Nineveh was dark. Israel was broken. The culture was fractured. But God's word always accomplishes everything it has been sent forth to do. And at just the right time, the word which is sharper than any two-edged sword, active, living, and breathing, it came to Jonah. And this is where the story begins. See, Israel had been overrun by the Assyrian Empire. But how? And why did this happen? 
After King Solomon died, the nation of Israel descended into chaos, idol worship, and infighting. Ultimately, it would separate into two. Ten tribes in the north, two tribes in the south. Ultimately, this decision to split up would lead to Israel's exposure and downfall. For without a united force to protect a united kingdom, invading armies would end up carrying the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah off into captivity. Hear me, friend. This is always the tactic of the enemy. Divide and then conquer. But here's what you need to be aware of. Division rarely announces itself as division. It announces itself as preference. And when you wage a war for preference, no one wins and everyone loses. Do you know that marriage is where personal preference goes to die? Do you know that church is where personal preference goes to die? The only place personal preference thrives is in isolation, and that's why so many folks are lonely today. See, we got this dangerous pattern in our culture. Folks can't stay in one church for too long. Folks can't stay in one marriage for too long. Folks can't stay in one relationship or one job for too long because they just can't stand the idea of being in a place that doesn't cater to their preference. Newsflash, you aren't the center of the universe. Every time you show up to this church on Sunday, you are going to find at least one thing that you don't like. Welcome to adulthood. We've been waiting for you. For if the devil can't defeat you, he will divide you because a divided people will defeat themselves. I've seen churches split over the color of the carpet. I hope this church don't split over the color of the new chairs you sit on today. I've seen churches split over the style of music. I've seen churches split over non-essential areas of doctrinal difference. I had a guy a few months ago send me a message on Instagram saying the Lord was leading him away from our church to a different spot. I said, why? Why? He said, well, because I know, Pastor, you don't agree with me about the shape of the earth. I said, what do you mean? He said, the earth is flat and it's clear. And on Sunday, you talked about God reaching people from all around the globe. I said, well, wherever you go, don't go too far. You might just fall off this flat earth. I wish that was a joke. It's not. We've got churches embracing sexual heresy. We've got antichrist politicians encroaching on our freedom of worship. We got the city of Seattle legalizing drugs and decriminalizing theft. We got wars and rumors of war, famines and earthquakes. It has never been more important for the church to stand together, for the church is only as strong as she is united. And make no mistake, battle lines are being drawn. You will either bow to the culture or you will bow to the cross. You will either worship confusion or you will worship Christ but the time for playing games is over now watch verse 3 watch what this mighty man of faith and courage Jonah does watch what this apostolic prophetic leader in the nation of Israel does but Jonah ran from the presence of the Lord and he headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and he sailed for Tarshish to flee from the presence of the Lord. Hear me, friend. The most miserable you will ever be is when you have a call of God on your life, 
But instead of running to him, you run from him. You were built for the presence of the Lord. You were built for the high call of God. You can't escape this. You can't deny this. You were formed in your mother's womb to accomplish the purposes of God in your generation. When you are marked by God, there ain't one other thing that will satisfy like being smack dab in the middle of his will. See, Jonah fled to Tarshish because Tarshish was easy. It was convenient. It was non-controversial. It represented everything Jonah wanted to do in his flesh. See, friend, our flesh, it craves the path of least resistance. But the path of least resistance rarely leads you in the direction of God's best. But see, everything worthwhile is on the other side of your stubborn commitment to pursue the things of God. And if it was easy, everyone would do it, and most people don't. <laughs> like you, I got a million reasons not to be in this region. Every day, it feels like it gets more tempting to move somewhere else and live somewhere else and plant a church somewhere else and I always joke when I travel and preach other places, oh man, maybe God will have us put a church in sunny San Diego. I'm not sure. I kind of say it tongue in cheek, but the reality is I got to wake up and remind myself I am here with purpose on assignment to do something for the kingdom of God. And if not us, then who? And if not now, then when? You are the righteous remnant of God in the Pacific Northwest. And if we leave the city falls, so buck down, build a house, plant a vineyard. It's our time to see the kingdom of God advance. Verse 4. So the Lord sent a great wind. <laughs> Some of y'all have to shift your theological stance this morning. It don't say the enemy sent the wind. It don't say the demon sent the storm. It don't say the darkness created the climate. It says the Lord sent a great wind and such a violent storm arose that it threatened to break that ship up. Now all the sailors was afraid. They cried out each to his own God. They threw cargo in the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. Could you just appreciate the juxtaposition of these two verses for a moment this morning? The pagans are on the ship crying out to their God. While the prophet is sleeping while the storms are raging around him. There ain't one person you'll ever meet who ain't religious. There ain't one person you'll ever meet who doesn't worship something. And can I tell you the chaos that we see in our culture is an entire generation of people who were built to worship, finding their affection and their identity in lesser things. And all the while, the prophets of God are sleeping while people are crying out, cutting themselves, looking for hope and love in all the wrong places. And yet we carry the answer. We carry the hope of glory. God has given us the keys to the kingdom in this hour. And I would dare say it is time for the prophets to wake up because every other God is an idol who cannot see and cannot hear, but we serve the one true living God, the God God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who is faithful to a thousand generations, who is close to the broken and the contrite, who is quick to respond to the prayers of his people. It is time for prophetic voices in the Northwest to wake up. The Lord sent a word, but when that word was ignored, the Lord sent a wind. See, friend, we ignore the word of God to our own peril. For if we are not people of the word, we will be people in a storm. 
And there is a violent storm raging in our culture. It threatens to break apart the very fabric of our nation. People are losing their minds and throwing their cargo into the sea. And yet nothing will satisfy the storm until the people of God wake up. I don't know about you, but I have never had a peaceful experience with an alarm clock that has woken me up. In fact, I was scrolling on social media the other day and an ad popped up in my timeline. And it was advertising an alarm clock that specialized in playing smooth jazz to wake the sleeper up in the morning. I knew right away that if I were to utilize that alarm clock in my life, not only would I not wake up, it would push me into a deeper sleep than I had ever been in before. No, the alarm clocks that, wake, that, that work best are the ones that most irritate you when you're most comfortable. How is it that it takes you three hours to fall asleep Rolling every which way, trying to get hot, trying to get cold, trying to find the perfect position. But as soon as it's time to wake up, you are the most comfortable you have ever been in your entire life. No, you need an alarm clock that gives you a panic attack. You need an alarm clock that causes such a great startle and fright, you think the Russians are invading. You need an alarm clock that sounds like a bat out of hell, screeching at the most annoying frequency that you don't have a choice but to wake up. Can I tell you that one of the primary issues we face in the church of God today is that we have leaders who think it is peacetime, but friend, it is wartime, and we need spiritual alarm clocks to wake up the people of God. You see the way people treat their alarm clocks? They're beat up, abused. They're cussing that thing out every morning. They're hitting it, trying to find the button to turn it off, snooze another 15 minutes. The alarm clock is the most abused piece of electronics in any American family household. But all of a sudden, when I recognize that, it gave me context for the blowback we get in this church. Because a lot of people want to be a voice, but they're not willing to pay the price for, being what be, for what being a voice commands of them. And so instead of being a voice, they become an echo. And if you want to be a voice, you got to be willing to pay the price. Because voices that cause people to wake up always disturb the comforted before they comfort the disturbed. Verse 6. The captain went to Jonah and he said, how can you sleep? How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God and he will take notice of us. So they asked him, tell us who's responsible for making all this trouble. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? See, up until this point, Jonah has blended in. I'm just like you. I'm an Assyrian. I'm just a trader. I'm just a traveler. I'm just a merchant. I'm just one of many in this empire. I'm not no different. I'm not a believer. I've never heard of that God. I'm definitely not a Jew. I'm definitely not a Hebrew. That's definitely not my lineage. I'm just an under cover Christian in the boat of my life and in verse 9 by the spirit of God all of a sudden Jonah comes in to a supernatural moment of sobriety because everything is on the line and Jonah decides I'm going to stop hiding today I'm going to stop pretending today. I'm going to stop blending in today. I'm going to stop being ashamed today. Oh, I hope nobody finds out I go to pursuit. I hope nobody finds out I worship like that. I hope nobody finds out I speak in tongues. I hope nobody finds out I support biblical values. I don't want to be canceled. I don't want to be thrown overboard. I don't want to be mocked or lied about online. I don't want to get demoted in my place of business. But in verse 9, when the storm threatens to sink the ship, a moment of sobriety hits Jonah and in verse 9 he says I am a Hebrew and I serve the Lord God who made the 
seas and the dry land. And today is my day of coming out of hiding into my assignment to be everything that God has asked me to be. God to use the storm of your life to remove every false layer of identity, everything that you have pretended to be, hiding up what you actually are. And sometimes we're actually cursing the storms that God has sent because when a great wind begins to blow, it'll shake everything that can be shaken to reveal stuff that can't be shaken. And the captain went to Jonah and said, how can you sleep? And I guess that's my question for the church today. How can you sleep in a moment like this? All right, Russ, we hear you. Then what's the answer? Get up and call on your God. You ever seen someone talk in their sleep? Or walk in their sleep? Or even worse, you ever hear someone laugh in their sleep? You wonder, what are you plotting? What are you thinking? What are you dreaming about? It's always interesting when somebody does that. Why? Because they are giving the appearance of being awake. All the while, they are passed out. And I feel in my spirit like the church in the Northwest has been doing a lot of talking in their sleep. A lot of walking in their sleep. A lot of laughing in their sleep. It is not enough to look awake. You must be awake because the days are dark and the hours are short. And it is what we do and how we live that will determine whether or not this boat will sink. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? And if we can't wake up in this moment, we are sowing the next generation into bondage like we can't even imagine. How can you sleep in a moment like this? How can you be casual in a moment like this? How can you treat church as an option in a moment like this? How can you not worship in a moment like this? How can you not give in a moment like this? How can you not be a part of the kingdom in a moment like this? If our culture isn't enough to wake you up, you're halfway dead and you don't even know it. How can you sleep in a moment like this? Get up and call on your God. And this is what Paul says in the book of Ephesians. He says, wake up, oh you sleeper. Wake up, you who slumber. Why? Because Christ, your great light, has shined upon you. Verse 11, the seas was getting rougher. And they asked Jonah, what should we do to make this sea calm down for us? He said, pick me up, throw me into the sea, and it will become calm. Watch, for I know that this is my fault, that this great storm has come upon you. Now let me say something this morning and I want you to hear my heart. I am pro-church. I am for the church. I am a supporter of the church. I am a local church person. We turn down a majority of the invites we get to preach other places because I'm going to be here on Sundays. We support the church, not just locally, but nationally and globally. But let me remind you what the scriptures say. Judgment starts first in the house of God. Watch Jonah. He says, you know what? Let me be honest. It's my fault for the storms that we're in. You wonder why the waves threaten to take out this ship? The winds threaten to break this thing apart? It is my fault. So throw me in. And can I tell you? It is ambiguity in the pulpit 
that has led to chaos and confusion in the culture. It is compromise in the pulpit that has led to brokenness and bondage in the culture. And we can be mad all day at how wicked Nineveh is. But Jonah, as a prophet, says, if I'm to be honest, it's because I've ran from the call. If I'm going to be honest, it's because I've run from the presence. If I'm going to be honest, it's because I've been lukewarm. If I'm going to be honest, it's because I'm broken and fractured inside. It's my fault the storm is here, but I'm taking responsibility today that God can still use the honest and the transparent to accomplish something great for his plans and purposes. The church is upstream. Culture is downstream. And so when it's broken in the church... It's destroyed in the cities. And this sermon today is a prophetic call. It's a prophetic unction. It's a message that will be heard by folks not just in this region, but maybe some around the nation and others around the world. And I hope these words resonate like an irritant within the chambers of the human heart until pastors wake up and realize the hour in which we live. The time is short. Redeem the days for they are evil. We have a God mandate in this hour and come hell or high water, I'm not going to miss it. Now watch. So they took Jonah and they threw him overboard. And the raging sea grew calm. And at this, the men greatly feared the Lord. They offered a sacrifice to God and they made vows to him. You got to see this. And Jesus says this in the New Testament. Unless a seed goes into the ground and first dies, it produces no good thing. The Bible says if a man seeks to save his life, he will lose it. But if he loses his life for my sake, he will find it. Jesus tells the crowds when they ask for a sign, no sign will be given to this generation except the sign of Jonah. For the Son of Man will go into the belly of the earth for three days and then be raised from the dead. Jonah in this moment is taking responsibility and ownership for the part that he has played. And in doing so, he recognizes his prophetic contribution to the days that are ahead. He don't say, drop me off at the nearest city and I'll just go back home. He doesn't say, let me just ride this thing out so we can reach where I want to go. He recognizes that the avenue of his transportation is not leading him to God, it's leading him from God. And he is not willing to wait one more day walking, running, or riding in the wrong direction. So he says, throw me over. I'd rather take my chances in the sea of obedience than in the boat of compromise. I'd rather take my chances in the storm of the unknown than in the safety of rebellion. Throw me over and just watch what God would do. I am reminded of the way that Jesus teaches on evangelism to his disciples. He says, do not say four months and then the harvest. Lift up your eyes for the fields are ripe unto harvest and pray the Lord of the harvest to throw you out into the harvest field. And to me, this is the true prayer and the true cry of every needed voice in the church of God in this moment. I know Nineveh is dark. I know the storms are raging around me. But I'd rather be with God in the middle of the storm than without Him anywhere else. So throw me in. <laughs> we have thrown ourselves into the middle of this harvest field. 
We have gotten ourselves in so much trouble only to see God bail us out. We bought buildings without money. We built houses that weren't ours. We planted vineyards on ground that we didn't own. And every single time, the God whose promises are yes and amen has come through on our behalf. And I'm asking you today, recommit to the harvest. Recommit to the harvest field. Put yourself in the field of play in this region. I'm not just willing to sit in the boat and make pharisaical observations about how bad the storm is. Throw me in. Put me in, coach. And just watch what God would do. Now here's where the story ends. Jonah 3. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. This time, according to the word of the Lord. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day walk. He cried out and he said, Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. If Jonah was taking a preaching class at the university, he'd have failed. It's the worst sermon that ever exists. There are no illustrations, no jokes, no giveaways, no context, no hermeneutic, no explanation. He is simply communicating what God has revealed to him. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth and ashes from the greatest to the least of them. And God saw their works and that they turned from their evil way. And God himself relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Why? Because God desires mercy, not judgment. But until he finds a man or a woman who will agree with his message of mercy. He can't release what he so desires to do in the cities and the nations of the earth. We are ministers of mercy. We are ministers of reconciliation. We are ministers of grace. We are ministers of compassion. But one of the most compassionate things that you can do in a culture built on lies is to simply tell the truth. And Jonah, as a prophetic voice, declares the truth in the middle of the streets of Nineveh. It was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, home to well over 120,000 people. It was a center of idol worship and darkness. Can God save a city hell-bent on destruction and wickedness? Just ask Jonah. Can God turn the heart of a wicked king and a lost people? Just ask Jonah. Jonah 3 records the greatest revival in all of Scripture. As an entire city gets saved in the context of three days. Because a man with a word decided he was done running from God. He was going to run to God and deliver the message of God to a region who had lost its will to live. What's the plan for Snohomish? Revival. What's the strategy for Seattle? Revival. How are we going to succeed in Kirkland on the east side? Revival. How are we going to grow in elementary school? Revival. If it's revival or we die, I choose revival. We are in a Nineveh hour, but we are a Jonah people. We are living in a Nineveh region, but we are a Jonah people. We are living in a Nineveh city, but we are a Jonah generation. So let God arise and let his enemies be scattered and let the city hear the truth of our God and of our King. Some of you here this morning and you're debating running from the very thing that God has called you to. Running from the very region God has planted you in. And I implore you by the mercy of God in Christ Jesus, 
Would you add your faith to mine and contend for what God would do, not just for us, but for our children's children? And could we see a Nineveh-wide revival take root in this region as well? You can play golf for the next 20 years in Scottsdale. Or you can get shot at every day with arrows and bullets and accusations. But in doing so, see the goodness of God in the land of the living. It is not easy and it's not for the weak. But for those who would put their hand to the plow and not look back, the reward of God awaits the righteous. Let us be righteous seeds planted in Nineveh's soil. And in doing so, see the kingdom of God advance. Let me pray for you, Father, now in the mighty name of Jesus. We ask that by your spirit, you would do the necessary Holy Spirit heart surgery in our lives. For those who are here this morning who are running from God, running from his presence, running from their assignment, if you would hear him calling your name, do not harden your heart, but come back home to Jesus. For those who have spent the last number of years in hiding, ashamed of the gospel of Christ Jesus, today would you be bright and bold in your declaration of faith? You are a child of God who serves the one who created the lands and the seas. Oh God, today, I pray that your call would take root in the deepest parts of our heart, that you would possess us with a mandate from heaven that we simply cannot shake. And for our inheritance, give us the Pacific Northwest as a hotbed of revival and reformation so the next generation will know that our God still answers by fire, that there are still men and women who can preach seven word sermons and see the fire of God fall. There are still men and women like Jonah and Elijah of old who believe that God can do what the Bible says he can do for God is who the Bible says he is. Oh God, raise up in this house those type of voices and those type of leaders for such a time as this. We'll give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor, both now and forever. And all God's people said amen.